Hello, everyone, and welcome again to Chew Magna. As you can see, things are a bit different this week. Uh, we have the builders in, and uh, they're repairing our ceiling. But we're going to carry on with our series looking at uh, parts of the book of Jeremiah. And today we're going to look at chapter 29, and John Bishop is going to read that scripture for us now. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elassa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. The passage John has just read contains one of the most well-known verses, one of the most often quoted verses in the whole of the Bible. It's also one of the most often claimed promises in the Bible. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Some of you will be able to recite it by heart. It's a verse that has become very precious to me. One of the promises of God I clung to over what was a very difficult period in my life when we first moved back to the West Country in 2014. I can honestly say that I've never experienced a worse time in my life. It was a time when I cried out to God. I could see no hope, no light at the end of a very dark tunnel, no way out. I found myself turning to the Psalms regularly, finding them helpful in voicing how I was feeling. For example, these words in Psalm 130 uh, had real uh, meaning for me. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. Again and again, I needed to go back to God's word to remind me of his character, that he will never leave me or forsake me, that he will bring good out of this, that nothing can separate me from his love. His promises are true even when I don't feel they are. God's plans for me are good and for my welfare not to harm me, plans to give me a future and a hope. He's called me and I have obeyed his call. And that's all God asks of us today, to heed his call and be obedient. 
one of the other things that I was helped by, and indeed I found very helpful during the present coronavirus crisis, is a regular pattern of daily prayer and readings. Quite often, the particular prayer or meditation for the day will speak directly into our situation. And now looking back, I see that God's promise has indeed proved to be true. His plans were and are for my well-being, not to harm me, even though at that difficult time I found it hard to see the reality of this. I believe Jeremiah 29 verse 11 is one of those few verses that we can say holds for all God's people down through the ages. It applied to God's people in exile in Babylon 2,500 years ago. It applied in the life of Joseph in Egypt centuries earlier and it applied in the life of Paul in the first century AD when he wrote in his letter to the Romans, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. And it still holds true for God's people today here in 2020. This is because we believe in a God who is constant, unchanging, true to his word, the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. We also believe God is in control of history, a God who is sovereign. There are some who seem to have a bit of a problem with the idea of God being sovereign. They look at the world and see all that goes on in it, and they come to the conclusion that God can't be in control, otherwise most of those things wouldn't happen. I'm afraid that I too struggle with understanding all that goes on in the world. But I would struggle even more if I didn't trust in a God who does understand and is ultimately in control of everything, from the smallest subatomic particle to the deepest, darkest black hole, who sees the big picture and who is working out his purposes. To say and believe that God is sovereign is to declare that he rules over all times, nations, languages, cultures, races, classes, and all genders of people. He rules over kings and governments, over all political systems, over all religions, over all the financial markets, over the natural world, the stars and planets, over the very fabric of time and space itself. And he is working out everything according to his plan. But as well as being sovereign, God is also always good. He is love and he is actively at work for good in the lives of his people. This is what theologians call God's providence. God's sovereignty is his right and power to do all that he decides to do. In the Old Testament, Job recognised God's sovereignty when he said, I know that you, Lord, can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. But notice that nothing in that definition of sovereignty refers to God's wisdom or God's plans. It's just his right and his power. You have the right and you have the power to do what you decide to do. When he decides to do a thing, he does it and no one can stop him. That's sovereignty, all right. So to make sovereignty a Christian concept, not just a philosophical one, we have to bring in other things we know about God from the Bible, like his wisdom and justice and righteousness and grace and love. Providence includes what sovereignty doesn't. Providence is sovereignty in the service of just, good and wise purposes. As somebody has said, providence is wise and purposeful sovereignty. And God in his providence, and because of his sovereignty, is able to achieve his purposes, even with those who do not acknowledge him, even working through those who actively oppose his will. This is the case here in Jeremiah with Nebuchadnezzar. So yes, I maintain that Jeremiah 29 verse 11 is a promise we can claim for ourselves, and it is for all those who truly seek God with all their heart. Because there is another promise here in our passage from Jeremiah. It's this. God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. 
I will be found by you, declares the Lord. This is a promise Jesus restates when he says, those who seek will find, those who ask will receive, and to those who knock, the door will be opened. I suppose we need to say that those who don't really search for God are unlikely to find him. And also that if you're not one of his people back then or today, if you don't love God, then things won't always work out for your good. Whilst God wants the best for all who he has made, he will not overrule your free will to ignore or reject him, although I believe he weeps when you do that. But my intention was not just to focus on that one verse in Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, important though it is. This chapter in Jeremiah has much to say to us, and I believe there are some things that God would have us learn as the people of God in our situation today. Firstly, these are words addressed to God's people in exile. At this time, most of God's people were living in a country where they were foreigners, among those who did not worship their God and did not respect their culture or ways. Their home is far away and they're an oppressed minority living amongst people who at best tolerate them and at worst persecute them. Does that sound familiar? Michael Frost is an Australian writer on mission. In his book, Exiles, Living Missionally in a Post-Christian Culture, he writes that the experience that faced the Jewish exiles mirrors the church's experience today. In fact, the biblical metaphor that best suits our current times and faith situation is that of exile. Just like the Jewish exiles, the church today is grieving its loss and struggling with humiliation. The ground has slipped out from under the church. The passing of Christendom might be compared to the fall of Jerusalem. We do live in a time when the church is increasingly marginalised, under pressure to conform to our society, a society that increasingly does not respect God's ways and laws. We live in a time when the majority of people have little or no knowledge of what the Bible says or even who Jesus was. We live in a time when all faiths are held to be of equal worth, when atheism is heralded as the only rational response for our enlightened times. Living as a Christian in modern Britain does sometimes feel very much like living as an exile in a foreign land. So how should the people of God respond to being, to being in exile? God through Jeremiah has some practical and perhaps surprising instructions in verses five and six of this chapter that we're looking at today. The message is build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. Some of the exiles in Babylon were living as though they would be returning to Jerusalem any moment. They refused to put out, down any roots or settle in any way, shape or form. Why bother, since God is going to come and take us back home to Jerusalem any day now? And some so-called prophets were encouraging this attitude. If you read back in Jeremiah chapter 28, you'll hear about Hananiah, the false prophet, who was saying that God had told him that within two years the Lord will come and restore the exiles to Jerusalem. No point in making any plans in Babylon then. Sadly, some Christians are a bit like this. They're convinced that Jesus is going to return soon and they spend so much time looking forward to this and the prospect of being in heaven with Jesus forever that they fail to engage with the here and now. They fail to see what God is doing today. And there are still false prophets who encourage this attitude, who are convinced that God has told them that Jesus is coming back soon. What does the Lord say to the exiles through Jeremiah? He says, get involved, put down roots, get a job, plant your gardens, have a family, live now. 
God says, I don't need people who have their heads in the clouds. I need people with their feet on the ground, people who are able to relate to the society that they are living in. And this is reinforced by what comes next in our passage, because as well as settling down, the exiles are to seek the welfare of the city where God has sent them. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. The Hebrew word in this passage translated welfare, or in other translations peace, is shalom. This is a rich Hebrew word, and it means much more than the absence of strife. It's about wholeness, prosperity, both material and spiritual and emotional. It's about completeness, about harmony, contentment, well-being in body, soul, and spirit. This principle of praying for the welfare of our society is reiterated in Paul in his first letter to Timothy, when he urges that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And Paul gives the reason for seeking the peace of God or the welfare of God for all people because it is good and pleasing to God who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So my question is how intentional and seriously are we praying for our communities? Is it a priority? How often do we pray for our towns, villages, our locality in our personal prayers or when we get together for corporate prayer? Whilst I was living in Cowes on the Isle of Wight, a number of us gathered once a fortnight specifically to pray for our town and community. I'm feeling convicted that this is not something I've continued here. Frank and Deborah Green founded the Prayer Network in Manchester in the early 2000s with the aim of drawing Christians from across denominations together to pray for their city. They write in their book, City Changing Prayer, that the call was to pray for our city, not just for the churchy stuff, but for the very fabric of the city, its life, health and prosperity. So we pray for the police, for social services, for schools, for young people, for race relations, for business, for the arts, local politicians, the health professionals, for the prison and probationary service. We ask God to act for his glory and for the benefit of the city. Praise God that we've already been able to see and celebrate some of his answers. The inspirational Bible verse for their ministry is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, which says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There's another one of God's promises that I believe holds true for today. So how will we respond? Firstly, and this is connected to prayer, we can bless our communities. Many Christians I know have been touched by a book called The Grace Outpouring by Roy Godwin. In it, he proposes a very simple biblical principle, the call to pronounce God's blessing upon people, places, communities, businesses. Blessing someone is simple, he writes. The Holy Spirit comes because when you bless, you are reflecting something of what the Father is doing and speaking words the Father desires to be said. God's desire to bless is outrageous. Nothing can stop him. He has set himself with the immovable intent to bless mankind. In the Old Testament, one of the key roles of the priesthood was to pronounce God's blessing upon the people. Thus shall you bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. When Jesus came, he was revealed as our high priest. 
He is the presence filled without measure, ministering to God and releasing incredible blessings upon all who receive him. And you and I, if we're Christians, are called into a new priesthood, the priesthood of all believers, called to carry the presence, minister to God and speak, pronounce, invoke, release blessings upon people. Putting this principle into practice has brought transformation to individuals, families, businesses, whole communities. I think most of us will have seen or heard the YouTube video made by churches across the UK and beyond, in which Christians from all denominations and none sing a blessing over the nation. The UK version has been viewed over three million times and even came to the attention of our Prime Minister. People today, more than ever, need to hear that God is for them, not against them, that he is with them and loves them. Of course, speaking a blessing over individuals or over communities or over whole nations is one thing, but we are also called to be a blessing. Each day we're to practically bless those we encounter. Praying and blessing is one way we can seek the welfare of the places and the people where we live. But it's not restricted to just these wonderful activities. There are other things that we can do. As Christians, I believe we must also seek the welfare of our city in even more direct ways by getting involved in our communities. This can be in projects such as Street Pastors, which is doing wonderful work amongst those who frequent our town centres on Friday and Saturday nights. You're never too old to get involved. There are Street Pastors in their 70s and 80s. And this work is undergirded by prayer pastors who intercede for the work as the pastors are out on the streets. I was blessed to be involved with the introduction of school pastors at the largest secondary school on the Isle of Wight. And over the two years it had been running when I left, we had seen a tangible change in the atmosphere within the college, which staff, governors, parents, police, and the wider community attributed to the presence of Christians within the college community. As Christians, you know, we also need to get involved with our local community organisations, in local politics or as school governors. In a time when people are shying away from making this sort of commitment to our communities, Christians should be stepping forward and demonstrating a joyful willingness rather than a begrudging, I suppose I'll do it because nobody else will. I wonder what opportunities there are for us, for you, to get involved. I know we have limited resources, but sometimes we need to take positive steps to release people from their responsibilities within the church in order for them to be the church in the community. Across our network here in the Chew and Yo Valleys, there are clear opportunities for us to join in what God is already doing, whether it's through the community library or the Renew Wellbeing Cafe, through food banks or debt counselling, there are numerous opportunities within our schools and preschools, through our work with families and the elderly, or through opportunities we still yet don't even conceive of. We are called to be a part of the answer to our prayers for God to bless and prosper our communities. Jeremiah, as Jeremiah prophesies, seek the welfare of the city, for in its welfare you find your welfare. It is to our benefit to work for the welfare and peace, the shalom of the community in which we live. So in summary, the word to the exiles in Babylon from Jeremiah was, to paraphrase it very loosely, be patient and wait for God, seek him, and get on with living amongst the people I've placed you among. Perhaps this is a word for his people today in the midst of this time of coronavirus. Listen once again to these words of promise in Jeremiah, this time from the message paraphrase, read again by John Bishop. This is God's word on the subject. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. 
plans to give you the future you hope for. When you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I'll listen. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. I'll turn things around for you. In these days when the future is uncertain, those are words we need to hear and believe and act upon. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us. Thank you that your word is truth. And thank you that it is for our encouragement to inspire us and to prompt us into action. So I pray we will take on board the truth of your promises to us, that your plans for us are good and for our welfare, not to harm us, but to give us a future and a hope. And I pray, Lord, that you'll also show us clearly how we are practically able to uh, seek the welfare, the uh, well-being of the communities, of the towns, the cities, the villages in which you have placed us. And I pray, Lord, that you will spur us into action, um, that we would see uh, where you are working in our communities and go and join you. And I pray that through these difficult times, we would hold on to your promises and trust that you are able to work good out of all situations. And I pray these things in the glorious, wonderful, powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And now may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen. Amen.